try and get all young people to be uh, activists, whether they're my family or not. You know, it's, it's up to them, it's their future. I tell them that, you know, we're, we're all gonna be part of this action, this positive action. For our generation and for the generation between mine and uh, <laughs> my grandchildren, uh, the job is to uh, get on with making any changes you can for the better because whatever we do now is going to ameliorate their situation in the future by a little bit. They're going to have a worse future than ours, no doubt about it, in terms of environment that they live in on this planet, uh, just because of the tracks that we have set in motion, you know, the acidification of the ocean, the warming of the ocean, the changing of currents, the changing of ecosystems. We're not passing on to them uh, the kind of world that was passed on to us by our forebears. The positive tipping point has already happened, which is the, the human brain. You know, we've, we've come to realize the error of our ways. And sure, there's still deniism, as they call it, and, and there's quite a bit of doomism around as well. But I think for the rest of us, you know, for a grandfather like me talking to my granddaughters, it's, uh, hey, we've all woken up to the era of our ways, and that to me is a tipping point, you know. So when you've woken up to it, uh, the future has to be different. And uh, I think that's the path we're on towards this green transition. I don't think it's a question of the choice between pessimism and optimism. I don't really accept it uh, because I'm neither. Um, I try and think of uh, sort of pragmatism as the as the, the third choice and hard-headed pragmatism in this case. You know, you've got to make tough decisions. You've got to make sacrifices. But uh, yeah, instead of optimism or pessimism, go for hard-headed pragmatism. scary uh, the way things are speeding up. Uh, we're talking about, of course, melting of the cryosphere, in particular ice on land. Uh, if you think of the ocean as one big bathtub, you're turning on the tap, and the, uh, if it's a bathtub, it's all going to go up. If you think of a place like uh, Tuvalu, which is a neighbor to my country of Fiji, you know, there's no land higher than uh, two meters. Then you couple that with the fact that uh, storms are going to be more frequent and uh, more fierce, uh, which is what is uh, predicted by all the best of our Earth scientists. And uh, storm surge, of course, uh, it's, it's existential stuff for these low-lying countries. Working as a scientist, you're always building hypotheses and you're testing the hypothesis with data and you're validating it and then you're re rebuilding your hypothesis. So the ability to bring that thinking to uh, business enterprises I think is fascinating because when you get to business enterprises, decision making is a combination of experience, intuition and data. And building the thesis, building the hypothesis, tweaking it iterating it, creating a iterative approach, and the ability to start to see what is coming on the way and assimilating that 
to make impact for your business. I think is what I uh, I love. It's a virtuous cycle of gut, data, gut. Uh, you start a thesis on gut, you validate it with data, and when you get close to 60 to 70 percent of um, uh, of conviction that it is the right decision, then you start to make that decision because you don't want to stay behind by waiting for that validation all the way till 100 percent. You should at least get to 40 to 50 percent conviction for a decision, but you should not cross more than 70 to 80 percent. Uh, by the time you take the decision because otherwise you're going to be behind the curve. You're going to be delayed. I'm a believer to uh, surround myself with people who are not like me. I'm a believer to surround myself with people who I can work with, but I, 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 I should be able to work with them even if I disagree with them. Uh, so I have a lot of things around me which are very heterogeneous. Growth lies in heterogeneity. I believe vulnerability is a strength. It's not a weakness. So as a CEO of the company, if I'm able to uh, express my weaknesses and if I'm able to ask questions which I should not be afraid of uh, I think it gives a sense of comfort for the rest of the company to stay vulnerable Air pollution is the silent killer, first and, first and foremost. 8.1 million people a year are dying because of air pollution related health risks. Parents, when I when I give talks to the general public, uh, it's not so much are they going to take my job. It's what are my kids going to do? What should I teach them? Uh, what what courses should they take? And in the near term, uh, there will be demand for AI engineers and robot engineers. But in the long term, it's got to be interpersonal skills. Right? It's going to be a very different kind of economy when. Uh, the, the production of the basic wherewithal of life uh, is turned over to machines. And uh, so think about what that means in terms of almost everyone being self-employed, uh, the kinds of education you need to be good at interpersonal roles, 
uh, and and how we succeed in delivering high value in those roles. Soft skills are going to matter a lot. If we think about generative AI specifically, uh, about content creation, about doing more creative work, more collaborative work, more digital work, work that is more boundless in terms of geographies, then cultural awareness is going to matter. Uh, sensitivity to humans is going to matter. So I think probably something in the human sciences, uh, psychology or child development or something like that, because I, th I think um, in the long run, it's the human sciences that we're going to depend on uh, to have a functioning society. Um, I would like I would like also to say the humanities, uh, because you know a huge part of what it means to be a human and, and to have a rich life depends on art and literature and uh, and that type of learning. very easy to get caught up in the hype cycle of AI, but the reality is we have to have an epistemic humility about this. We don't know exactly where it's going. And as a result, I think job creation will focus really on those people that are able to adapt and change and pivot and can keep up in the age of AI with the pace that it's going at and have that humility, as I mentioned, to know that we simply don't know where some of this might go and to be ready for where it brings us. I tend to disagree a bit about there is ambiguity of where AI is going to take us. At least in my line of work, it's extremely clear uh, where we're going to be in 10 years from now. If AI delivers on its promise, it's going to come in a way where there is going to be a big eradication of a certain layer of employment and a certain layer of work that people are just going to be very inefficient about uh, in, in doing. And AI is going to be just so much more efficient at doing this that, that there, there will be no reason for a human in the loop uh, to, 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 to exist anymore. Too many CEOs, when I talk to them or policymakers, the first place they go is AI should automate this job or AI is going to automate that. And it's true that sometimes AI can automate instead of augment. But usually the bigger opportunities are for augmenting, for using AI to make the job better um, and to increase what people can do. Sometimes there are things that we can largely replace what's happening. Um, but I think the big wins are in keeping humans in the loop and using AI to add to creativity, to add to quality, uh, allow people to do their jobs better. And that's where people should be focusing more of their attention. If we want to get away from this idea that we're just going to put humans out of jobs and that's how we're going to make money, right, is to look at exactly the things, the unmet needs, right? If you, if you look at met needs where humans are already fulfilling that need, then typically that need is saturated. And so if you want to be on the upside, you've got to look for those unmet needs. And uh, individual tutoring of children is one of those unmet needs because it's incredibly expensive for humans to do it. We can't possibly have a tutor for every child, yeah. right? It just doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but other things like, you know, cleaning up graffiti, like inspecting uh, cargo containers, we just can't afford to have people do that. But we could afford to have people do that if they had a team of robots to, to, uh, to expand their, their productivity in the role. The world is making more progress on the intelligence front but it is still, we're getting there slower on the wisdom part to be able to use intelligence quickly. I think we do need to find ways of having a grown-up conversation on how we're going to govern the new technologies in ways that will put some guardrails in. How are we going to make sure that there's access to these technologies? But we just need to learn from a lot of history in, in terms of the risks of letting intelligence run ahead of wisdom. What you're asking workers to do 
is trust that the skills that are being created, the tasks that are being replaced, and the new tasks that are coming to the fore will make them have a better standard of living. Why should they trust that? And what happens if they don't trust? Then they reject the technology. When you roll out that technology as a company, as an NGO, as a university, you know what you'll get? An eye roll in return. I'm not doing that. I'm going to block that technology. I'm going to prevent that technology from coming to my state. I'm going to rally against that technology because I fear it. And so we have to give workers something to trust. And I think that starts with this interpersonal level in communication. How you roll out that in technology is going to be important.